Jane Stevenson is my name. My husband, Hugh Stevenson, and I were born in Scotland, some 40 miles south of Glasgow. We came to this Indiana Territory to begin our life as husband and wife. We came across the Valley of Virginia upon the backs of horses, and upon other horses we placed our farming tools and cooking utensils. In fact, everything we own. Our life is hard, but we've stuck to it and I believe we'll do all right. There are now 15 other families scattered across this fertile Ohio River plain. They too are Scots, from Edinburgh and Paisley. On the Sabbath, we visit and we worship together. We pray for each other and for the folks we've left behind in Scotland. The Presbyterians downriver in Louisville have promised to send a preacher our way. We will build a proper meeting house soon. This faithful and intrepid band of Scots Presbyterians did build their meeting house in 1820, and Presbyterians have been worshiping on this spot ever since. Who are we Presbyterians, and how did we get to be this way? Presbyterians have beliefs in common with all Christians, but we have certain characteristics that have always been important to us. We believe that God is God of all of life and not just the church. And our church is a, a church in the world, not a world in itself. What's your name? Elodie. Because we believe that God alone is sovereign of the conscience of each human being, we support democratic forms of expression. In our congregations and everywhere else in our church, we debate so that all may be heard. We vote and the majority rules. The ministry of our membership is important to us. We believe that God works through members as well as ministers. Also, we understand that God's word found in the Old and New Testament should offer guidance for our lives. The Bible informs what we believe and teaches us how we are to live in the world. That's why we Presbyterians make a special effort to listen to all of the Bible. And sometimes that's difficult. But rather than pick this part or that part, we try to affirm God's message for all in its entirety, so that God's will may be truly done on earth as it is in heaven. We order the life of our church this way today and have done so throughout our history so that in our worship, teaching, and living, God may be honored. We tell our church's story to demonstrate what God has done and is doing. When we are at our best, what we Presbyterians believe and do is directed toward this one goal, to honor God. That is the sum of our history and tradition. Presbyterians in the United States are one branch of the worldwide Christian family. To understand the Presbyterian story, it is necessary to begin with the story of the whole people of God. Presbyterians believe that God created the world and everything in it, but the Bible calls the reader's attention again and again to God's actions in the lives of particular men and women. We believe the Bible gives witness to God's saving activity in the world throughout human history. God calls women and men to service. God makes claims on people's lives. Along with other Christians, American Presbyterians see the coming of Christ as a turning point in history. In Jesus Christ, the majesty of God was found in human form. In his day-to-day -day life, Christ experienced the joys, anxieties, and fears common to all people.
God's will for the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ, who was crucified and then rose from the dead, became the church's central message. This message is the good news Christians proclaim to all the world. After Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples became the first members of a courageous worldwide movement, the Christian church. Jesus' ministry had taken place mostly among the people in Galilee and Judea. But the apostles and elders who gathered in Jerusalem recognized that God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ was intended for all people, not just the Jews of Roman Palestine. And so, the Christian mission began to spread throughout the world. From Jerusalem, apostles like Peter and Paul carried the message of Christ to the north and west along the well-traveled trade routes of the Roman Empire. Within the first generation after Christ, the good news of the gospel had spread south to Ethiopia and eastward toward India. Christian communities were a force for change in people's lives. Because of this, many rulers of that day regarded the church with suspicion. In A.D. 64, the Emperor Nero found it convenient to blame the Christians for one of the worst tragedies of his reign, the burning of the city of Rome. He ordered mass arrests and had many believers put to death. Pliny, who was the governor of the province of Bithynia, sent this report about the Christians back to his emperor, Trajan. This new faith is being embraced by many of all ages and every rank, and also of both sexes. It is their habit on a fixed day of the week to assemble before daylight and recite by turns a form of worship of Christ as a god. They bound themselves with an oath, not to commit theft or robbery or adultery. Despite continuing persecution, the number of Christians increased rapidly during the church's first three centuries. In 312 AD, the Emperor Constantine, caught up in a vicious civil war, was preparing to defend Rome. After taking up a defensive position at the Milvian Bridge near the city, he had a vision, a vision of the cross of Christ. He saw the words in the sky, in this sign you shall conquer. Constantine's army won that day, and the emperor of the Roman Empire eventually became a Christian. During the century following Constantine, the church went from a condition of persecution to one of acceptance and it acquired a vision of transforming the Roman Empire into a Christian Empire. Imperial patronage of the church was climaxed when Theodosius made Christianity the official religion of the state. The leaders of the state church began to oversee the gathering in of great wealth and worldly power. Imperial gifts and wealthy bishops built basilicas finished with solid gold and precious stones. Where there was corruption in periods of the church's history, reformers came forward to call Christians back to their biblical roots. A French contemporary of St. Francis, Peter Waldo, encouraged people to read the Bible in their own language and called on his followers to rely on faith in Christ for their salvation rather than in elaborate sacramental rituals. 200 years later, the Englishman John Wycliffe called on the church establishment to give up its material possessions and political power. He began one of the first translations of the Bible into English. John Huss proclaimed his vision of reform in Prague. Here in 1415, Huss was burned at the stake. Next, we shall see how the spirit of Christian reform, advocated by Waldo, Wycliffe, Huss, and the others, flamed in the hearts of Martin Luther in Germany and John Calvin in Geneva. We Presbyterians in the USA are the children of their reformation. The people of 16th century Europe lived in a period of renaissance. It was a time of openness to new ideas in all areas of human endeavor, a time to question authority. It was also the dawn of the age of print. Johannes Gutenberg's newly invented press made books affordable so that the common people could buy them. 
Also, there was a rebirth of appreciation for ancient cultures and their accomplishments, along with a careful re-examination of the earliest texts of Christian writings. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century was a religious revolution and challenged Christians to return to their biblical roots. This revolution was carried forward by people like Martin Luther. His life and work eventually shook the foundations of Western civilization. In 1517 in Germany, this 34-year-old priest was a professor of biblical studies at the University of Wittenberg. After years of rigorous and disciplined prayer and study, Luther became convinced that Christians were called through faith to a direct relationship with God, a relationship which required no priestly middlemen. As Protestants, we Presbyterians see Martin Luther as one of our spiritual ancestors. But we trace our descent more directly from John Calvin. While in his 20s and a student in Paris, Calvin came under the influence of reforming Catholic scholars. The government's growing persecution of French reformers forced Calvin out of his homeland. He would live as an exile for the rest of his life. At Basel in Switzerland, he completed his first of several editions of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. That same year, 1536, while traveling from Italy to Germany, John Calvin stopped at Geneva. The city had only recently adopted the Reformed faith and had driven the Roman Catholic Prince Bishop out of his cathedral on the hill. The fiery Protestant leader, Farrell, persuaded the visiting Calvin to stay and help in the building up of what Farrell hoped would be a holy city established upon a foundation of Reformation principles. Now rid of the controlling bishop, some citizens of Geneva looked for less rigidity in the city's life. Instead, they found in Farrell and Calvin zealous disciplinarians. After two years, a newly elected town council gave Farrell and Calvin three days to leave the city. Within a year, a complete reversal of Calvin's fortunes occurred. The city council found it could not govern effectively without Calvin. He returned to Geneva, was installed in a fine house, and given a substantial salary. From here, the 32-year-old pastor, teacher, and theologian established his vision of a holy commonwealth. Calvin insisted that the truest test of a person's faith is love for the neighbor. Further, this greatest theologian of the Reformation believed that a theology written in textbooks must also be written in lives. Education was central to Calvin's vision of the social order. With his colleague, Theodore de Beze, he founded the Academy in Geneva. The old building is still used today for the education of young people. For Calvin, God's sovereign love means there is no aspect of private or public life which is beyond God's care and concern. Not even the sewers of Geneva were beyond Calvin's sphere of interest because he understood their potential for destroying the health of the city. In the medieval Catholic Church, power had come to rest in the hands of a single bishop. Calvin recommended that authority be exercised by representative groups of ministers and elders. The early church had a shared ministry of apostles, elders, and deacons. The word Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyteros, or elder. Presbyterians are governed by ordained church officers known collectively as presbyters. Calvin died in May 1564. He was surrounded by those who shared in his struggle to reform Christ's church. John Knox, the Scottish reformer, was another religious exile in Geneva during Calvin's time. While there, he witnessed the gospel's power to transform systems of government. For Knox, religious faith had an inevitable effect on the world outside the church doors. When he returned home, Knox fought for religious and political reform. He thundered opposition to the Catholic Queen, Mary Queen of Scots. Scottish nationalism united with Protestantism to overthrow the government and religion of the country's rulers. A parliamentary tradition was established. 
Reformed theology, embodied in a church governed according to Presbyterian principles, began to spread across Europe. And in an age of exploration and colonial expansion, it was not long before Presbyterians found their way into the New World. The first Presbyterians to make their way across the Atlantic to North America were not missionaries, but colonizers. The lands they came to claim had long been inhabited by people who lived as members of sophisticated nations and nomadic tribes. For Calvinists, coming to America was a God-given opportunity to establish a new social order based on the biblical covenant, a holy commonwealth. Throughout Catholic Europe and its colonies, Protestant reformers who had been condemned as heretics lived in terror. Presbyterians and other people of the Reformed faith fled from persecution in Europe and sought a fresh start in North America. Most of the early American Presbyterians came from the British Isles, from England, Scotland, and Ireland. In 1640, a Presbyterian congregation at Southampton, Long Island was organized. At that time, there were only 40,000 settlers in the British colonies of North America. One-tenth of them, 4,000 people, were Presbyterians. A little more than 10 years later, a Dutch Reformed congregation worshipped here at Newcastle in Delaware. More than 100 years before the American Revolution, this congregation became Presbyterian, and it thrives to this day. By the 1670s, Scots-Irish settlements were springing up in the Chesapeake Bay region of Maryland. But worship services were few and far between. Urgent appeals for more ministers were sent back to the British Isles. In 1681, Francis McKimmy was chosen by his presbytery of Lagan in Ireland to minister among the exiles in far-off America. McKimmy's pioneering ministry took him up and down the Atlantic coast. He was one of seven Presbyterian ministers who gathered at Philadelphia in 1706 to form what they called the General Presbytery. As they returned to their homes, these Presbyterians realized that in a basically unchurched America, each minister was a missionary. In the spring of 1707, Lord Cornbury, governor of New York, jailed McKemmy for preaching without a license. Cornbury called the rebellious McKemmy a disturber of governments. McKemmy told the jury that his license to preach came from God and that as an English subject, he was entitled to fundamental civil rights, including freedom of speech and freedom to practice his religion. McKemmy was acquitted. American Presbyterians became champions of the freedom to worship, to preach, and to teach without interference from civil authorities. Lord Cornbury would not be the last English colonial official to refer to rebellious Presbyterians as disturbers of government. Our Presbyterian ancestors organized a general senate in 1716. One of its first acts in 1717 was to create what they called a fund for pious uses. This money was devoted to supporting missionaries as they took the gospel to new settlements springing up in the West and South. The West in those days was, of course, Western Pennsylvania and Western Virginia. Educated ministers still came from British universities, but training American preachers presented a challenge to our young church. In 1746, William Tennant set up his own school known as the Log College in Nasimi, Pennsylvania. He educated a generation of Presbyterian ministers, including his own sons. From the inspiration of Tenet's Log College arose the College of New Jersey, later to become Princeton University. Charleston in South Carolina was first settled in 1670. It became the port through which Presbyterians proceeded into the Carolinas and Georgia. Here, the Reverend Archibald Stobo served several Presbyterian congregations in the early 1700s. He had little communication with Presbyterians far to the north. Charleston Presbyterians founded their presbytery in 1722. When Charleston Presbyterians were taxed so that Episcopal churches could be built and maintained, Stobo and two neighboring Presbyterian ministers rebelled. 
From this fertile ground sprung the first Scots Presbyterian Church, founded in 1731. Over the centuries, this congregation has survived earthquake, fire, tornado, and more than one devastating hurricane. Through the many generations of its life, the congregation has faithfully served the gospel of Christ through its worship and mission life. In the 1730s, a spiritual revival spread like wildfire through the colonies. Inspired preachers exhorted huge crowds to experience a spiritual rebirth. For the revivalists, the personal experience of God's grace was of first importance. Presbyterians caught up in the enthusiasm of this great awakening were called the New Side, while traditionalists came to be known as Old Side. Just as the new side felt their opponents were lacking in grace, the old side were suspicious of anyone who would substitute emotional excess for right belief. In 1741, the old side and new side divided into separate synods. It was the first division in American Presbyterianism, and it lasted 17 years. But even in those years of division, the Presbyterians moved forward in mission. David Brainerd, a 21-year-old student at Yale College, was caught up in the spiritual fervor of the Great Awakening. He threw himself wholeheartedly into mission with American Indians of New England, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Another convert of the Great Awakening was Samson Oakham. He was a Mohegan Indian who was ordained a Presbyterian minister and was sent as a missionary to the United Nation. He worked to establish Dartmouth College as a school for Native Americans. Because of the isolation of churches in colonial America, the Lord's Supper was usually observed only twice a year during a communion season lasting three to five days, according to Scottish custom. In 1747, the Synod of New York sent the Reverend Samuel Davies from the Presbytery of Newcastle as an evangelist into Virginia. One summer, in a two-month period, he rode over 500 miles on horseback over wilderness trails. He preached more than 40 times near Hanover, Virginia, and in 1755 he became one of the seven organizers of Hanover Presbytery. Davies was a gifted poet, preacher, and educator, and he included within his ministry the African slaves who lived in the homes of his parishioners. He was allowed to baptize more than 100 of them, and friends in England sent Bibles and Watts hymnals for distribution to the African congregation. Davies and others also taught many of the African slaves to read. In 1758, Old Side and New Side reunited into one Presbyterian church. However, just as religious controversy among Presbyterians was declining, political controversy was increasing. By the 1770s, the people of colonial America were divided over urgent calls for independence. Presbyterians were found on both sides before and during the Revolutionary War. In many households, it was sons against father, family against family. On the battlefield, many of General Washington's general staff were Presbyterians. In the midst of the Battle of Springfield, New Jersey, in 1770, American soldiers were running short of gun wadding. So the Reverend James Caldwell rushed inside First Church. He grabbed a handful of Watts hymnals from the pews, and he gave them out to the waiting troops, shouting, put Watts into them, boys. Another American patriot, Ann Schuler, rushed into her wheat fields near Camden and set them ablaze rather than allow the enemy troops to provision themselves. Back in London, Horace Walpole rose in Parliament to denounce the American Revolution as that Presbyterian rebellion. In all, nine Presbyterians signed the Declaration of Independence. The Reverend John Witherspoon was the only active clergyman to pen his name. This act of rebellion could have cost each one of them their lives. As our national government was getting itself organized under its new constitution, our Presbyterian Church was getting itself reorganized. We will pick up our story in Philadelphia, May 1789, when John Witherspoon convened the first General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America.
The first General Assembly of American Presbyterians was convened by the Reverend John Witherspoon at Second Presbyterian Church, Philadelphia, in May of 1789. This Witherspoon was an educator, parson, patriot, and politician. He was born in 1723 at this small village in Scotland, only a few miles down the road from the birthplace of John Knox. Witherspoon's father, James, was the parson of Yeaster Parish. This is the kirk in which Witherspoon was nurtured. At age 14, he was enrolled at Edinburgh University. At age 20, he began his ministry, which was most successful. In fact, he became so prominent that in 1768, he was offered the job of president of Princeton College in far-off New Jersey. When that first General Assembly got down to work, the commissioners elected the Reverend John Rogers of New York as moderator. They expressed a concern for the spreading of God's word. A vote was taken to print and circulate faithful impressions of the Holy Scriptures. They moved to consult with Presbyterians who would prefer a more independently congregational form of church government. The assembly organized the work of new church development and missions on the frontier, and they exhorted the 17 existing American Presbyteries to join in love for each other and in loyalty to Christ. Congregations continued to spring up in the east and along the routes of the westward expansion. Women's groups in congregations organized societies to promote missions. Presbyteries struggled to supply the need for ministers. In order to conduct mission more effectively and out of concern for the unity of all Christians, Presbyterians and Congregationalists adopted a plan of union in 1801. This multiplied the founding of congregations, which some people called Presbygationalist, across the American Midwest. The First Presbyterian Church of Chicago was organized under this plan. The following year saw the creation of the General Assembly Standing Committee on Missions with the Reverend Ashbel Green as chair. Presbyterians resolved to send more missionaries among the American Indians. One of these missionaries was Gideon Blackburn of Tennessee. He founded churches in Nashville and northern Alabama, preached among the Cherokees and taught men, women, and children the fundamentals of reading, writing, arithmetic, as well as the Christian religion. Blackburn also tutored his slave, John Gloucester, who accompanied him on the missionary trail. Blackburn then gave Gloucester his freedom. Moving to Philadelphia, John Gloucester was licensed to preach by that presbytery, and in 1807, organized the first African-American Presbyterian congregation. The interesting thing about Gloucester is that while he pastored that church in Philadelphia, he also had to spend part of his time raising money in order to purchase the freedom of his wife and his sons who remained in slavery. Gloucester was not only involved in preaching and administering the sacraments and <clears throat> engaging in social work amongst the free black population in Philadelphia, he was also concerned about other blacks who remained in slavery in the South. As in John Calvin's time, Faithful Presbyterians in the United States set a high value on education. Seminaries were created to assure excellence in the training of ministers and missionaries, but energy and money was also committed to the forming of hundreds of colleges and schools across America. The educational process began with the youngest in Sunday school and proceeded beyond the graduate level. This high value we set on universal education is an important component of who we are as Presbyterians. Samuel Austin Worcester, a native of Vermont, spent his career as a teacher and pastor to the Cherokee people. When gold was discovered on their tribal lands in 1828, the state of Georgia seized their property and drove them on a brutal forced march to reservations west of the Mississippi. This was a total violation of the solemn treaty obligations and in violation of a United States Supreme Court ruling supporting the Cherokee. Georgia imprisoned Worcester for 16 months at hard labor for his protests. Still in his prison garb, 
He and his family proceeded with the Cherokee on their trail of tears every step of the way. Worcester remained with them, organizing a church and school and a printing press for the publication of Bibles, hymnals, and a Cherokee almanac. A young United States was becoming a global political and trading power, and Christians were feeling the need to take the gospel to Africa, Asia, and the islands of the Pacific. In 1810, a diverse group of concerned Protestants, including Presbyterians, organized the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. In 1831, the Synod of Pittsburgh founded its own missionary society. A few years later, the General Assembly established a board of foreign missions which then appointed 44 Presbyterian missionaries, 20 of whom were women. In fact, as time went on, the majority of American Presbyterian missionaries were women. Enthusiasm for missions around the globe and across North America was fueled by a new wave of evangelical activity known as the Second Great Awakening. Preachers called Americans first to faith in Christ and then to a crusade for social reform. This did not play well with defenders of theological orthodoxy. Once again, division threatened the church. Some groups had broken away from the Presbyterian Church in the early 1800s, among them the Cumberland Presbyterians and the Disciples of Christ. Then in 1837, the General Assembly split between New School Revivalists and Old School Traditionalists. Differences over theology, polity, and slavery aggravated tensions and caused the division. Each time American Presbyterians divided, the world's need for Christ's gospel and mission continued, and Presbyterians responded. In 1836, Dr. Marcus Whitman and his wife, Narcissa Prentice Whitman, and Henry Harmon Spaulding, a minister with his wife, Eliza Hart, left New York State as missionaries to the Nez Perce and the Cayuse Nations of the Pacific Northwest. Narcissa Whitman and Eliza Spaulding are believed to be the first white women to cross the Continental Divide. Whitman organized the first Presbyterian church west of the Rockies in 1838. In 1847, hostilities broke out between the white settlers and Native Americans. Too much blood was shed on both sides. A raiding party attacked the Whitman's outpost on November 29th, and they were among the 14 Christians found slain. Many church leaders in the North and the South, especially among the New Schoolers, were early advocates of the abolition of slavery. Henry Holland Garnett, a distinguished Presbyterian minister and successful newspaper editor, in 1843 made a fiery address to the National Congress of Colored Americans. He warned the nation that Negroes might choose revolt as a just response to the injustice of slavery. The Reverend James Henley Thornwell preached eloquently that the spirituality of the church should be kept apart from political disputes. He insisted that the institution of slavery was supported in both the Old and New Testaments. When slaves were able to read the same Bible for themselves, they were able to develop what we would today call a liberation theology and focus on passages where Paul says, for freedom, Christ shall set you free, stand fast, therefore, and do not submit yourselves again to the yoke of slavery. The Civil War erupted in 1861. American fought American, and Presbyterian fought Presbyterian. For President Lincoln, this war was fought to preserve the Union as set forth in the Constitution of the United States, a Constitution he had sworn to preserve and defend. Later that year, a Southern General Assembly was founded here in the First Presbyterian Church of Augusta, Georgia. The Reverend Benjamin M. Palmer preached the opening sermon and was elected moderator. The war's end signaled a rebirth for the United States, but the open wound of Presbyterian disunity would take much longer to heal. Heartbreak and bitterness were driving the affairs of our nation at the close of the Civil War. 
the Northern General Assembly adopted a new set of standards for readmittance to their church. Before Southern Presbyterians could be reconciled to the fellowship, they had to formally admit that secession had been a sin and renounce their error of ever having considered slavery a divinely endorsed institution. Because of this attitude toward the former Confederacy, a number of congregations in border states like Missouri and Kentucky withdrew from the Northern Assembly and joined the Southern denomination. For more than 120 years following the Civil War, Northern and Southern Presbyterians would remain divided. So by 1869, there were three principal branches of American Presbyterianism. The chart looks like this. The denomination that came to be known as the Presbyterian Church in the United States and referred to as the Southern Presbyterian Church had united its old school and new school factions. The United Presbyterian Church of North America was made up of two American branches of dissenting churches of Scotland who united before the war in 1858. In 1869, the old school and new school in the North agreed to compromise on their outstanding differences. So the Presbyterian Church in the USA was formed. These Presbyterians understood the church's mission as a great struggle for the soul of this country. And they organized under the battle cry, One Nation for Christ. Presbyterian ministers had moved west with the growing population to establish congregations. Salmon Giddings organized churches in St. Louis. In 1817, he organized the first Presbyterian church, which is the oldest west of the Mississippi to have a continuing existence. James Hogue was for 50 years pastor of First Church of Columbus, Ohio. William McWerb organized the first Presbyterian church in Florida at St. Augustine in 1824. Daniel Baker went into the Texas Plains in 1840. David McFarland was commissioned in 1866 to work among Mexicans at Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 1852, William Spear, a former missionary at Canton, China, began work in San Francisco among 30,000 Chinese immigrants. In the post-Civil War years, all three Presbyterian churches expanded their missions among the four million newly freed Negroes in the South. The Northern Presbyterians supported people in mission like Lucy C. Laney, the daughter of slaves and founder of the Haynes Normal School at Augusta, Georgia. In the Southern Church, men like the Reverend Charles C. Jones of Georgia and the Reverend John B. Adger of Charleston, South Carolina, pioneered religious instruction for slaves. Other Southern missionaries continued this work to freed men after the war. Knoxville College was begun as an extension of that Christian commitment to freedmen after the war. Founded in 1875, the current enrollment of the college is more than 1,000 students. The Civil War was followed by a burst of westward expansion, which wiped out the American frontier in two decades. From the 1860s to the 1890s, America's population doubled to over 63 million. The expansion of Presbyterianism into the USA was in direct proportion to the financial support Presbyterians gave for home missionary efforts. By the turn of the century, there were over one million American Presbyterians. More than half of these Presbyterians were women. Women were in the vanguard of the church's mission work in our congregations and at every level of our church's life. They were creative and successful promoters and fundraisers for an advancing Presbyterian mission across the United States and around the world, and yet they were not eligible for ordained office. Since there were no women ministers or elders, there were no women commissioners to general assemblies. When the annual report of a women's mission board was presented, it had to be read to the assembly by a man. This inequity would not be resolved until the 20th century. Sheldon Jackson relied heavily on the women of the church to fund his national mission efforts. He traveled more than 26,000 miles each year between 1869 and 1881. He may have been the only man in America to have an unlimited pass on all railroads in the West. It was said, wherever the Reverend Sheldon Jackson goes, civilization is sure to follow. 
He established more than 100 churches in Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and Arizona. From Denver, he published a monthly paper, the Rocky Mountain Presbyterian. And later, when he had established the Alaska Mission in 1877, he printed the Sitka North Star. In 1884, he was appointed Superintendent of Education for Alaska, where he introduced public schooling in 1885. Sheldon Jackson College, Sitka, originally a training school for Klingit Indians, honors his life and mission to this day. Amanda McFarlane was a co-worker with Jackson. She also became prominent as an educator and community organizer. She was the first resident Presbyterian missionary to work in Alaska. Although she had only minimal medical training, she often acted as a doctor and nurse, teacher and preacher in the villages where she worked. At the start of the 20th century, Presbyterian mission in our cities was constantly expanding. Neighborhood houses for immigrants were established in all major cities. For example, in San Francisco's Chinatown, Donaldina Cameron and her colleagues rescued more than 1,500 Chinese women and girls from slavery and prostitution. For 40 years, she worked to provide the women with literacy, occupational training, and opportunities for further education. She became known among slave owners as the White Witch. She signed her letters, Lo Mo, which means Little Mother. Donaldina Cameron retired in 1938. Cameron House and its ministry in Chinatown continues as an inspiration to the whole church. Presbyterians have lots of things in common with other Christians, but they also have certain characteristics, things that they emphasize. These include right belief, and righteous living, but to a certain end. That is, not to save their souls or not out of arrogance, but so that God can be honored. In the movie, The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy landed in Oz, if she'd been a Presbyterian, the first thing she would have done was to establish a church where there could be preaching and the sacraments, which for Presbyterians are visible words. But then she would have established a school, a hospital, and a missionary society. And the end would have been the same, so that God could be honored. All three major branches of American Presbyterianism were committed to worldwide mission. United Presbyterians established synods in North Africa, the Middle East, and the Indian subcontinent, which were an integral part of the American-based denomination. Others taught that mission should lead to independent local churches in every land. John Nebius, an American Presbyterian missionary to Korea and China, persuaded the Presbyterian Church in the USA that the goal of its board of foreign missions should be to create churches which would be self-governing, self-propagating, and self-supporting. The Southern Presbyterian Church committed itself to global outreach, sending its first foreign envoys to open schools and missions in China and Brazil. By 1926, this denomination of less than half a million members had more than 500 missionaries active in a dozen countries. Physicians were among the first Presbyterian missionaries to Asia. The first resident Protestant missionary to Korea was the Presbyterian physician Horace N. Allen, who arrived in 1884. In 1885, Horace Underwood began his mission life in Korea. He was the first of four generations of Underwoods to faithfully serve there. Today, two of the several Presbyterian denominations in Korea count more than two million members in almost 6,000 congregations. Samuel Lapsley and William Shepard were appointed as missionaries by the Southern Church in 1891. They established the American Presbyterian Mission in the Congo. Lapsley died of a fever shortly after his arrival in Africa, but Shepard continued the work for decades. Shepard mastered languages and dialects and became a familiar figure aboard the Southern Presbyterian mission boat, the Lapsley. William Shepard was later joined in Africa by William Morrison. Together, 
they struggle to call the world's attention to atrocities being committed upon Africans by European colonial powers. For example, these children in Morrison's parish had their hands cut off by the Belgium overseers for not gathering their rubber quota fast enough. Today, the Congo mission is called the Presbyterian Community of Zaire. It numbers 1,300,000 members in 656 congregations. As the 19th century drew to an end and the 20th century began, American church leaders were instrumental in founding the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. In 1910, the Edinburgh Missionary Conference began a labor of Christian love that blossomed into the ecumenical movement. In 1912, Woodrow Wilson, an active Presbyterian elder and a former president of Princeton University, was elected president of the United States. As president, this same Woodrow Wilson would lead the United States in a war designed to make the world safe for democracy. In the 1920s, modern science and new information about human beings and how they function encouraged many in the Western world to adopt new ways of thinking. New tools were forged for the study of the Bible. Many Christians believed the time had come to tell these timeless truths using the images of a new day. The fundamentalists, as they came to be called, criticized modernist theologians for stressing human action in place of reliance on the sovereign power of God. The church in the north was torn apart by this fundamentalist modernist controversy. Some general assemblies backed the fundamentalists. Other general assemblies did not. At last, in 1927, the general assembly rejected fundamentalism as the official doctrine of American Presbyterians. By the start of the Great Depression in the 1930s, Presbyterians serving Christ through congregations, presbyteries, synods, and national mission boards struggled to feed the demanding hunger of both souls and bodies. At the conclusion of the Second World War, some Christians believed that strengthening the unity of Christ's church would give support to a lasting peace. In 1948, the World Council of Churches came into being at its first assembly in war-ravaged Amsterdam. The three main American Presbyterian denominations at that time were charter members of the World Council and were active at home as the old Federal Council of Churches was reorganized into the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the USA. Congregations were caught up in a post-war spirit of religious inquiry. It led to the adoption of a new Christian education curriculum in both North and South. Congregations grew, unprecedented numbers of new members joined. The 1950s were a time of tremendous economic growth in the United States. Congregations in suburban neighborhoods prospered. In 1958, the Presbyterian Church in the USA and the United Presbyterian Church of North America joined together to create the United Presbyterian Church in the USA. This new denomination of American Presbyterians included congregations in every state. The first deaconesses were ordained at about the time of World War I. Then in 1930, the Northern General Assembly voted to admit women elders. Those opposed to women's ordination believed that God's holy word found in the Bible supported their opposition. Margaret Towner, the first woman pastor in the North, eventually became vice moderator of the General Assembly. Rachel Henderlight, the first woman ordained minister in the Southern Church, was later elected president of the Interdenominational Consultation on Church Union. It was exciting to meet the 10 people from the other churches and to see how alike we were in our thinking, after all.
During the 1950s, the churches became more involved in the civil rights movement to end segregation. African American Presbyterians North and South were involved in the struggle. In 1963, the stated clerk of the United Presbyterian Church, Eugene Carson Blake, was arrested outside Baltimore for participating in an attempt to desegregate an amusement park. A month later, he and hundreds of other Presbyterians from South and North joined in the March on Washington. But the Civil Rights Movement had its deepest impact on our Southern churches. There, issues had to be faced congregation by congregation and presbytery by presbytery. In time, Union presbyteries would be organized in the border states. In 1969, new negotiations were opened in hopes of reuniting the Northern and Southern Presbyterians. This effort would require 17 years of hard work. I was born in China, uh, son of missionary parents. I was born on what was called and, and publicized as a Southern Presbyterian Mission Station. It was up in Jiangsu Province, which everybody in China calls North China. And uh, the Northern Presbyterian Church was in China, too. And guess where they were? They were down in Canton, which is in South China. And that never did make any sense to the Chinese. And it never made any sense to the Americans why there should be a split church holding on to the hostilities of a civil war that was over 100 years old. Um, you know, if you, if you claim that you have found a reconciler, and you are not reconciled with your own brothers and sisters, it weakens what you say about uh, the one in whom you believe. The two General Assemblies met in Atlanta in 1983 and took final action on Presbyterian reunion. The reunited church adopted ten historic confessions and within eight years added to these a brief contemporary statement of the reformed faith. Presbyterians produced a new hymn book and a new book of common worship for use in our congregations. In 1988, the national offices of the former denominations were consolidated and found a new home on the banks of the Ohio River in Louisville, Kentucky. Here, church workers carry out the tasks assigned to them by each General Assembly. God's world is diverse. Our nation is diverse, a nation of different races and cultures. All this affects the church. A singular challenge for Presbyterians at the end of the 20th century is whether we are willing to put time and money into nurturing our faith and our church. Throughout history, Presbyterians have attempted to live in accordance with God's covenant in Jesus Christ. Sometimes that has led to disagreement and fragmentation, but Presbyterians have always sought to honor God through worship and mission. And always, Presbyterians have rediscovered unity in their common love of the gospel and have found strength for the journey in the loving community of their congregations.